morning and welcome to our public worship service at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with our resident pastor Martin Duffield leading our morning worship for the last Lord's Day of 2023. We remember our church family undergoing difficulties. Uh, we understand, uh, under, as has been announced previously, Alan Clark has been seriously unwell over these past two weeks and whilst it's pleasing to have him present with us this morning, we appreciate by no means he's fully recovered. So uh, we trust that that recovery will be ongoing. We commend you, Chad and Rosemary Palmer, that they have encouraging and other news, so please remember them in your prayers. We think of Karen Jessup uh, undergoing a medical procedure recently. We think of Wendy Nielsen's sister, Glennis. And of course, we commend to you, Matthias Seiler, as he continues with his bi-monthly treatment, which was undertaken <coughs> in this past week. Uh, for our man's family, we're thankful for a measure of better health over this past week. But again, commend it to your prayerful concern. We would just note that Martin and Judy will be absent on annual recreation leave and long service leave for four weeks as of Monday the 8th of January. We think of all of our church family members in retirement complexes, particularly we commend to you Reverend John Mercer. He's becoming increasingly physically weaker and it is concerning, so please be prayerful for him and his family. We think of those who are seriously ill, Jean Millard and Michael Nuckler. Following our service this morning, we have morning tea in the hall, so please come across for a further time of fellowship. We commend to you evening worship, 6.15pm today, with uh, Pastor John Tucker leading that hour of worship. Just a reminder that our regular congregational group meetings are now in recess throughout January. Next Sunday services, God willing, as usual, uh, the 7th of January, with our own pastor, Martin Duffield, leading morning worship, and one of our retired pastors, Reverend John Roth, leading evening worship. Just literature available, the latest edition of the Chalmers newspaper was made available to each family on Christmas Day, and there are still copies available here this morning. We also commend to you the Read, Pray and Grow devotional booklets, for the coming first quarter of 2024, there are still copies of those available as well. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. So worship God this morning by, sing, by hearing the call to worship from the 98th Psalm in the first three verses. The psalmist exhorts his people saying, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of all the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Amen. Let's now um, respond to his word, his call to worship him for all of those things that he has done and revealed. Um, and the intro is, uh, this morning is the first verse of the hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine.
Let's now meet with God to adore him in prayer this morning. Let's all pray. O God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is the greatness of your mercy that enables us to seek an audience with you today. It is because you forgive and restore that we not merely have hope, but we have confidence that you will receive us today in spite of our corruptions in nature and action as people. The very title Father bids us to come as children, flawed and sometimes failed, to meet with you for you cannot cast us off. You cannot reject us forever because of all your promises and the greatness of your compassion. Whoever calls upon you, you will in no way ever cast out. Oh, how blessed are your people who know you and who love you and who seek your face daily and weekly, even as we do this morning. Oh, Lord our God, for 6,000 years and more, your steadfast love for your people has preserved and protected us and given us peace and hope in the face of all of our troubles. You have loved us with an everlasting love. You have continually forgiven your wayward people more times than we can remember. Grace abounds in you, and grace abounds with you. You were long-suffering and compassionate, bearing with us in all our waywardness, and so we rejoice in this aspect among many of your nature, by which we, your people, are saved and preserved and forever. And so, our Lord, help us to worship you aright today, to give to you the glory and the praise that belong to you. For this we pray, to the praise of your glory, in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing from the 99th Psalm, God the Lord is King.
Let's give our attention now to God's Word, coming first of all from the third chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 26. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. <coughs> Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. And to God be all the glory. Amen.
But today, may with God, and this time to confess our sins to him for his forgiveness. Our Holy Father in heaven, how many sins are the sins asked? Are, are, are sins of unworthy repentance. How many ways can repentance itself be an offence to you and to your majesty? What of the sin of the refusal to repent? What kind of special is, evil is this by which a man or woman thinks that they have no need of repentance? By which they are unaware of the offence done to you, which are offensive to mere men, and even to themselves, but they do not understand if there is a holy and righteous God. When men do not know the law of God, they at least have consciences to testify to the guilt and the need of forgiveness, and yet, how many from how many today is there no fear of God or fear of judgment for the hard heartedness that they possess? And Lord, what are those who do repent, but who do so for the ears of men? who do so thinking that this frees them to sin again. Those who hide behind religious rights, thinking that they can sin as they please as long as they incorporate these religious rights into their lives from time to time. We know that this is a deadly delusion which afflicts many of all Christian denominations. And what are those who repent superficially? Not owning their particular sins particularly, not hating those particular sins and themselves with them while they engage in them. People who pray general prayers and who avoid the specific in a completely empty and false contrition, a heartless and an offensive routine which pleases no one, especially you, and does them no good except to delude them. Oh Lord, are there not occasions when all of us need to repent of our repentance? As preachers have said in the past, because our heart is not in it or not in it as it should be. Because the truth is not properly faced. Because the offensiveness is not properly appreciated and the damage is not owned. Especially the damage done to you and to your spirit who is grieved by all this. And so we pray today as we consider the theme of repentance and times of renewal, that you would help us to take the time to confront ourselves honestly when we confront you in our prayers. May we clear away all the evil that takes up residence in our hearts and minds. Lord, purify us as Jesus is pure, for we long to be like him and see him as he is. And we pray this with the forgiveness of all our many, many sins. In his holy name. Amen. Let's sing to the praise of our Redeemer Jesus, O Jesus, full of truth and grace.
our second reading comes from the Old Testament in the book of the prophet, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, um, and it's chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 to 14. Verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elazar, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and prefer, perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's now respond to God's word, some of those great promises to his ancient people by giving thanks to his team for his mercies to us in this past week or two. Well, Lord our God, as we come to the end of this year of our Lord 2023, we thank you for its months, its weeks, for its days and its hours and its moments. Thank you for every breath that we took and every grace we received and every good we were enabled to do, to do by your grace. We thank you for the promises of the year 2024 and the opportunities to glorify you in everything, no matter what your providence brings us. Thank you for life now and life to come and for a part in the great work of bringing in the harvest fields which are still white and ready to reap with the gospel. Oh God, would that we could reap a great harvest in it this year. And so take the gifts that have been given this past week and this morning and use them to that glorious end. For this we ask in Jesus' name and for the praise of your name. Amen. We're going to sing now a, a hymn of praise uh, to 
through our Lord Jesus, we praise you, O God, for the Son of your love. children and youth, but sometimes adults too. And our prayer is that at this time in our nation and our Western culture, that our Christian camps would be faithful in the full presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you would be pleased to open the hearts of those attending as they hear the truth. That there would be a faithful live testimony for those who are leaders and workers in the camps in their example and the things they say and do. They would be impeccable in all of that. We pray also today all for our um, for those who serve in the community, in the area of uh, local and national disasters. We thank you for the state emergency service and for these men and women who go into these extraordinary dangerous circumstances of flood and fire and cyclone to help those uh, suffering because of these disasters and to protect their property. We thank you for fire officers uh, who will be involved doubtless in many places in our country and already have been in, in terms of the great bushfires that so beset our nation. We thank you too for the police who must handle um, the problems with drunkenness and other substance abuse and domestic violence which come at the worst time of year when families should be united and at peace. We pray for the protection of these people in those dangers. We think of the paramedics who attend the accidents and other tragedies to which fire and police officers and state emergency services also attend when the things are serious. May they be effective in helping others 
given common grace to cope with the things that they see and have to deal with. We ask especially for Christians among them to be a source of strength and wisdom and grace to their colleagues as they bear the brunt of the miseries of the holiday season through accident and natural disaster. We ask also, Lord, for our Christian leaders, faithful men and women who are breaking from their churches and ministry programs, that they may be refreshed and prayerful about the ministry to Christ's people in the year 2024. That you would be pleased to raise more people willing to help in the local body of Christ in obedience to his call to them to love their brothers with the gifts they've been given to be faithful servants entrusted with those gifts and resources for his service and to bear much fruit in terms of encouraged souls and even new souls one with the gospel we thank you our God for all of these people for all of these ministries uh, and so many of them have affected us and continue to benefit us uh, even to this day we pray also our God for your blessing upon the word that comes to us from the prophet Jeremiah may we learn or relearn good things concerning yourself and your wisdom, your will for us. We ask it all in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So as we approach a new year, we get a reminder of the blessed possibility of a new start in our lives and a chance to change for the better. The traditions of New Year's resolutions, however, are for the most part often window addressing in people's lives as we know. Sometimes are even what we would call virtue signaling. It is a far cry from the true repentance of Scripture because the resolutions that are often made are only a desire for something new or better or different. Unlike repentance, there is no deep and searching assessment of the issues of past life for what is bad, and certainly not in the light of God and his will for his people. So today I want to look at a few verses um, past the famous promise of Jeremiah 29 11, where God reassures his people that after exile he would not abandon them, that after their 50 to 70 years in exile, depending on when they were taken into exile, uh, for their gross idolatry and moral and ethical evils. God will restore their fortunes, hence the promise in 29.11. Two or three generations would pass for God's people to be away from their homeland, away from the temple, away from their life in the land of promise, which came after God's promise to Abraham the land, and at times their hope also disappeared whilst they were away. However, it was not a promise that God would keep without any reference to the waywardness of his people. No, he would await until they had not only served their appointed time of judgment predicted by Jeremiah, but also when his people had arrived at a proper appreciation of the seriousness of what had been done to cause their exile and the destruction of their city and temple. And so he would wait until they cried, as he had waited until they cried in the past, particularly in books like the Judges. Then the repentance for their gross violations of his covenant would be real and heartfelt in the sinner. Then and only then would the blessings of repentance come safely to such reformed people and chastised people. So let's look at this promise from Jeremiah the prophet about God's future forgiveness of his wayward people in what was the dawn of repentance, our title this morning. And the first thing that we learn from it is that it is planted in the heart by God. The dawn of repentance breaks when it is after it is planted in the heart by God. Jeremiah's famous letter from God, which contained one of the most precious personal promises of God in 29.11, goes on in verses 12 to 14 to detail exactly how that comforting assurance would come to pass, that they would have a future and a hope. The spark for this return to God would begin in the heart, as verse 13 says, and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So this return to Israel from exile in Babylon would only happen and could only happen with God's powerful intervention. 
Most of you will remember Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. The purpose of that vision was to remind the Israelites in the depths of that dark exile, hundreds of miles from home, in the power and the grip of an ancient superpower called Babylon, and eventually the Medes and the Persians, that all things are possible with God, even if they don't think so. God had arranged it so that he would move in answer to his people's prayers. And he is pleased to wait for those prayers to come, and sometimes to wait until after they had come. In this case, at the end of two generations, and, there, and three for some, the longing to go home would stir that prayer for God's help. It took several generations, it seems, to be inspired. It was so in the judges and the kings sometimes, several generations before the heart was broken and repentance came, that God would have to allow the suffering of his people to intensify to the point where they would cry out, where they would gather to pray, where their hearts would be burdened heavily enough to forget everything else and to seek God. <coughs> in this case, it happened, as it happened often in the judges' period in that book, when oppression got so severe that the people cried out in pain after several generations of apostasy and idolatry. Then and only then, when pain had come and produced its result, did God respond. He never anticipated their repentance, but rather he lets them plumb the depths of misery so that the request comes from the heart. It is somewhat like breaking up hard soil. Time compacts the soil so that the seed will not penetrate easily. So the soil must be broken up with a plough. And thus, human suffering breaks up the hardness of heart. A heart hardened by constant exposure to evil Suffer and, and suffering, suffering strips us of the taste we have for pleasure, especially evil pleasures, so that in the end all we can think about is our pain and perhaps why God has ordained this pain for us. True repentance that leads to lasting change can have this kind of unpleasant inspiration. It seems in such circumstances until we are struggling or trapped helplessly in some appalling and miserable condition that we will not lift our eyes to heaven, much less look into our own hearts to see what is there. Reverend Laurie Peet was once asked by a widow just a few days after God took her husband away, leaving her in shock and grief. She, um, she asked why God took her husband away. So he asked her two questions. The first was this, before your husband died, did you ever think about God? And she replied, never. He replied, do you ever think about God now since he has taken him? She said, I cannot stop thinking about God. I have heard similar stories where only the names are changed. Until the trauma, the suffering, the grief, or the shock, no one and nothing could get a person to consider their God and his call upon their lives. So Israel went into captivity, finally in 586 BC, in incredible shock and trauma, not unlike what we have seen in the wake of the Hamas terror attacks in Israel. Words fail to describe the impact of this upon the psyche of a nation, a people and a culture. And yet it was this sort of experience that drove the ancient Israelites eventually out of a dreadful complacency and wickedness uh, and even straight out rebellion. It forces them to look at their lives through the tears and the shock of what happened to them and to ask the hard questions about those lives they've lived in the past and about how God sees them. God has their attention, we could say. It is bound up, of course, in one of Jesus' common warnings to his hearers when he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's found in Matthew 11:15. It's found elsewhere in his sayings in the New Testament. But it actually comes from Deuteronomy 29:4 and Ezekiel 12:2, where the ears are opened by suffering. 
Jesus lived in a time when, like Jeremiah, many people were completely hardened in their sins, particularly leaders. They had become so accustomed to sin that it didn't bother them anymore. No one, it seems, was getting upset about them. People couldn't be shocked, even if they knew something was wrong. It was like a fire complete to them. So far had moral and spiritual standards fallen, they were not reacting anymore to evil. Succeeding generations, of course, grew up with the sins in their age added to the sins of the previous <coughs> age. In our own case, if I could bring it closer to home, in the 90s, 1960s and 1970s, de facto relationships were a scandal in the public, even among non-Christians. But as we all know, within a generation, everyone is doing it. In the 1970s and 80s, homosexual lifestyles were deeply offensive to the community. But now children grow up with people openly living like this. And it is not only not offensive anymore, but it is celebrated and of course codified in the marriage law. There has been a tectonic shift as each generation of our Western world has increasingly rejected God and his word. Christian morals were once regarded as the norm. Then increasingly they became ridiculed as old-fashioned and as prudish. But now they are hated and regarded as bigoted and intolerant. People's ears are now blocked and their eyes are blinded to the way that God sees these behaviours that they no longer can see. And so we can say with Jesus, they no longer have ears to hear, nor eyes to see, nor hearts to understand. We are ripe for chastisement. In such circumstances, God's common recourse is to suffering, which forces people to think about God eventually like that widow, to ask perhaps if there might be some fault with me or with us. As C.S. Lewis said, and I quoted this a few weeks ago, God plants the flag of truth, pain, within the fortress of a rebel heart. No one else can, and nothing else can get the truth through, only pain. Out of the ashes of a miserable life, the ears are opened, the eyes unblinded, the hard heart is broken and softened, and now it's ready for God's will in its life. All the prophets had ministries involving this approach, in their case with terrifying warnings about the covenantal curses of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Take the time to read them today. And from God dealing with deaf and blind rebels in the past, the record of scripture contains many brutal examples what happens to a people which ceases to be sensitive and responsive to God's word, but becomes hardened to sin, and so much so that prior to the fall of Jerusalem, good had become evil, and evil had become good, just as is the case today in the West. In exile, eventually God's suffering people would have a deep and abiding change of heart. They would look back on the sins their sins and the sins of their fathers, previous generations, and they would understand exactly what did God did and why he did it. They would see that their sins and their father's sins and their grandfather's sins were so entrenched and so deep that like that widow, they never thought about God, or at least not seriously. But the trauma of brutal invasion, of mass destruction of everything they cherished materially, of mass casualties, including friends and neighbours and children, and the loss of all their property and wealth, as well as their homeland and their freedom, that would force them to radically change their attitude to God and to their lives. Prayer is the result of that kind of, um, of uh, uh, act of God. As one commentator put it, when God designs mercy, he puts it into the hearts of his people to pray for the mercy design. And when such a spirit of prayer is poured out, it is a sure sign of coming mercy. The dawn of repentance begins in the darkness of a sinful but now broken heart. Jeremiah was encouraging the exiles who had already gone in the previous assaults of the Babylonians in his letter to prepare for the worst with the temple about to be destroyed. But at least they were safe in exile. Once awakened to the danger and the trouble, there was one recourse left, wherever God's people were, and 
and that was prayer. And so the dawn of repentance not only gets planted in the heart, but it flowers from the lips. The dawn of repentance breaks with prayer. It is the first shaft of the light of life, whether for a person individually or for a people. When a man or woman, when a community or a nation is driven to heartfelt, genuine prayer, you can therefore expect things to start changing. You can expect to see things start happening. Because if God has moved men to pray, however he moves them, it is because he intends men to ask him to do what he intends to do himself. Up until then, all is darkness in the blindness of sin and the misery of consequences. But once the heart is prepared and prayer is forthcoming, as God declares to, to Jeremiah from those in exile so awakened, in these words, then you will call upon me and you will go and you will pray to me. Now these words are factual in what they describe. But they also reveal something of God's heart, as again one scholar put it. The words need no comment, but they cannot be passed over without dwelling on the infinite tenderness which they manifest in the prophet's soul, the reflex of a like tenderness in the mind of God, from whom he gives the message. It is the anticipation of a like message from the lips of Christ, when he said, He that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. As they stand, the words are also an echo of a number of promises in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 4, Jeremiah 29 and Deuteronomy 30. So God stands ready to answer prayer. Prayer that he has inspired, if not driven, out of his people. Sometimes by the motion of the Holy Spirit, but often by inflicting tremendous amounts of pain. To strip us of our complacency to break our hardened hearts and to humble us into a fit state whereby he can justifiably reward our prayer. Because he will not reward arrogance. He will not reward complacency. And especially he will not reward a person or a community where resident evil is within. Not, um, it is not sanctification that makes us acceptable. It is justification. It is faith in Christ and his sacrifice alone. But without sanctification, without a turning from our sin and the pursuit of holiness, we mock our claims to be justified. And so God prepares us, if we will not prepare ourselves, to come into a right and proper frame of mind by his pain and discipline. Once he has all the heart, then he can bless the prayer and encourage the humble petitioner to pray. In Jeremiah's situation, what would humble the nation was the awful event of the destruction of the city and the exile of his of God's people because that's how hardened those people had become. Once the pain worked its therapeutic way into the hearts and minds of people over perhaps decades, the humble would seek and did seek God both as justified and now sanctified and acceptable in God's sight. Old Halsby, the Norwegian theologian, said that prayer is the breath of faith. He's not alone in saying that. If you are truly spiritually alive, you will pray as naturally as you breathe when you are alive. You cannot not pray if you are spiritually alive. Only the spiritually dead have no need to breathe prayer. The healthier you are spiritually, the more you will breathe and need to breathe, just as the more active and healthier you are physically, the more you need to breathe. In dealing with stress and pain, you breathe more air physically. Your respiratory rate goes up of necessity. So in times of great spiritual distress and demand, you will need to breathe prayer more often, more deeply, in prayers of intercession and supplication, and we could add confession. See also the reference to calling and going with regard to prayer. Um, the Lord's Prayer is prefaced by the call to be alone with God, to seek God in secret, in contrast to praying on street corners as the Pharisees did for, kudos, for the kudos of a naive public. 
Jesus instructed his disciples to meet alone with God, to go away from the crowds, close the door behind with, behind them. He told them, as he told Jeremiah, that a penitent and needy people will go and they will seek out God to pray. Remember King Hezekiah, when he was threatened by the superpower Assyria and its army of 185,000 warriors, he went alone with the letter from Sennacherib. He went alone to the temple steps and he laid the letter out on the steps and he prayed as every good king should in such circumstances. He went to the house of God to meet with the God of heaven and he put his impossible situation before the God for whom nothing is impossible. From the very outset of world history, when, the, when threats like the rule of law started to break down, when marriage was being attacked by the rise of polygamy, and all through one man, the man Lamech, what did God's people do in Genesis 4.26? Well, I quote, Then man began to gather together to call upon the name of the Lord. I do not believe is it a coincidence that the gathering of men to call upon the name of the Lord, to use his specific covenantal name, begins when society and culture are under threat. It is a natural reaction, as we've already seen. When a threat is too great for us to deal with, as with the rise of Lamech and his evil generation, we must go to a greater power, especially when we know that this power is for us and is committed to us and to our defence. The pre-flood corruption of the rule of law and of marriage by Lamech has, as we know, many repeats in history, and we are now living in such times or at this moment. Marriage was the first of these two to be damaged, and the second regarding the rule of law is already under stress. We have seen examples of it in the USA, particularly in 2020, and in other places where um, rioting broke out all across the country. Places where the country is very corrupt, um, and the, that country also now has a public perception, according to the uh, surveys done of the public, that there is a two-tier justice system in the United States, one for the rich and powerful, and another for the ordinary citizens. So there is a strong sense in the United States and in other places that corruption has entered the courts. The response of corporate prayer, or gathering to pray together with God, to God, has an ancient precedent that God's people do well to follow, even without a threat. For praying communities are powerful communities. They have the power to transform life and circumstances if they harmonise their inspiration with the will of God. Individual prayer is urged upon us by Jesus in Matthew 6, 1 following. But corporate prayer is assumed by the Lord's Prayer because he did not teach us to pray, My Father, who art in heaven, but he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. It is a special ministry, and one which we see exemplified right through the Old and New Testament histories. It seems to have a special place in the church's life, when the church is living and powerful. A whack missionary named Paul Johnson visited Springshaw when I was a minister in Springshaw, and he said something like this to me about prayer. He said, you know, when we pray alone, God certainly accepts our prayer. But when we pray together, he really seems to bless it. It was, of course, one man's perception. But it is something that the history of religious revival in the last five centuries bears out time after time. Someone has said, it may be Ian Murray, the Reverend Ian Murray, that while it is true that there have been revivals where there was not much preaching, there, was never, there has never been a revival where there was not much praying. And this is because revival or renewal produces a tremendous seeking after God. Prayer is seeking after God, the true God and true Lord. And that Lord is our covenant head, our sovereign provider and protector. And we do well to take seriously those blessed words of Jeremiah 29, 12. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So let's turn to the response of God, to this heartfelt seeking, which uh, he stirs in his people by planting often 
the flag of pain within the fortress of their rebel hearts. The third point to draw to your attention is that this prayer naturally, as is promised, brings God's response. The letter from God concludes with this grand promise to a people languishing in exile, with many to join them soon. He said, and I will listen to you. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. That happened in 536 BC, about 50 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. This is a promise fulfilled to fulfill another part of the terms of the agreement between God and the Old Testament people, which is found in Deuteronomy 30 verses 1 to 4. This is what God promises before they've even gone into Canaan about the future. He said, Now it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God scatters you or drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and you obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart, with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and will have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of heaven, from there the Lord will gather you and from there he will bring you. And so as God threatened to expel his ancient people from the land, if they refused to listen to his warnings about disobeying him, and about engaging in the moral and spiritual evil of the Canaanites who were themselves expelled for their wickedness, so too, if they humbled themselves and prayed for mercy, God said he would forgive and restore. Jeremiah's letter from God holds this promise out to them. It was meant to give them great hope as they went in to the last 50 years of exile in Babylon. They would not become a nation that was scattered into oblivion and crossbred into non-existence. If they, are called, if they called upon God's name in true contrition and true honesty, seeking his forgiveness, then he promised he would restore their fortunes. And if you want to read how that happened, read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, which records the fulfilment of that promise to bring them all back, 50,000 of them in the first group that came back. The beauty of this today is that our God has not changed. He remains the faithful covenant God of his people, his new covenant people. The church is his people made up of Jew first and then Gentile. And she is able to call upon God through him and in his name for his help in providing and for protecting us. The great blessings of the new covenant can also be lost for a time and even a long time by the sins of his people as individuals and as bodies. It is by similar ways to the Old Covenant that this happens, by allowing false teaching, by neglecting and polluting public worship, by poor discipline and allowing immoral behaviour, by the toleration of any or all of these evils by weak or failing or corrupt leadership. What are the blessings of the New Covenant? We see them in the early church, Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. They are, very briefly, the hunger for the truth in the gospel, a church full of people who love the scriptures. They, you see it in the purity of the sacraments, a great caution and proper reverence in our approach to the sacraments. You see the restoration of the blessedness of the church in the warmth of the fellowship. You see it in the unity and the peace of the congregation. But you see it also, the blessings of the new covenant in the positive impact of the church's witness upon the world, that it looks at the church very positively. And of course the last one is people being convicted and converted from sinful lives. And all of that is in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, the pristine church. We could also add to that God's abundant provision of the church's needs to that, to that list in terms of financial and other support workers, 
for the ministries. God provides all of that in a healthy and happy church. But when those things are missing, or they are declining, they are a warning that things are not right within the body of God's people. The American Presbyterian Church growth author Donald McNair said that a healthy church grows naturally. And a healthy church is simply a faithful church in its doctrine, its sacraments, its discipline, its fellowship and its prayer. But all that can be lost, so all that can be lost is lost by fellowships all over the world because people and leaderships fail to guard the church's life from all these kinds of corruptions and you only need one of them to do the damage. And yet as we know all can be restored and has been restored if God's people, as we have heard, will seek God with all their heart. At a personal level, it is equally true. By neglecting your walk with God, by neglecting your private worship in prayer and scripture reading, by neglecting your family worship and your general spiritual and moral life, you can lose the blessings of God which come through the Holy Spirit. You can lose the peace and the power to live a godly life and fall into awful sin. You can become undisciplined and weak in the face of temptation. You can become lethargic and disinterested in the word of God and in the ministry of prayer. You can become complacent and negligent regarding the tenets of public worship. You can become negligent and irresponsible regarding the use of your God-given gifts and your calls to use them for the benefit of others around you unselfishly. You can become more self-centered and more selfish and less concerned about God and his work and his people. You therefore become a shell of a true Christian. Even though you may appear to be its most faithful practitioner in public to others, you only see the outer person, the religious, visible religious activity and profession. But inside, true repentance is an illusion and it's seen clearly by God. But again, the restoration of living faith is only ever a prayer away if you will seek God when you become aware of this death within you with all your heart. So the dawn of true repentance was captured in that famous covenantal remedy for national sin, and I'm sure most of you know it off by heart. It's this, from 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Neither the Christian nor the Christian church has a land to heal. But there are churches and ministries and lives that can be healed if God is sought with all the heart and if sin is rejected and submission and obedience is embraced. The dawn of repentance is a change of heart and it leads to a change of behaviour as a result. It begins with a true and accurate assessment of our lives in the light of God and his word. It proceeds with a heartfelt prayer for change and it ends with a changed life that is now in harmony with God's word and God's spirit and all to God's glory. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Father, as we come to the end of this year and we face a new year, we do pray that with this reminder that you would help us to redouble our efforts, to search our souls regularly to see our life, our behaviour, our thoughts in the light of Holy Scripture. We thank you for the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, heightens the demand for obedience to the thought life, because if it can be dealt with in the thought, then it will never appear in the life. And we pray for grace to be able to pursue that earnestly as individual Christians, as leaders of groups and as leaders of the church. May it please you, Lord, to keep us in a spirit of true repentance and that we might see as a result of that the evidence of true blessing in us and around us and through us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
we're going to sing a, a, a hymn of praise, a, a prayer for the Holy Spirit to work revival in our hearts. O breath of life come sweeping through us. Thank you. 